One of the big questions that we frequently get is, you know, what's the best way to find a listing? What's the best way to get a listing? These two questions in particular, they definitely imply a more passive approach. And you know that getting a listing is anything but a passive activity, right? That It takes work, it takes an effort. Most importantly, it takes proper strategies to get the result that you want. I also think that if you want to be able to truly solve the problem of finding listings or finding listing leads and just lead generation in general, I think a better question, a better place to start is to look at and study consumer behavior. If we know what their behaviors are, then we know what marketing to produce to meet them where they're at so that we can then actually cultivate them as a customer. Hi there, and welcome to the Chris and Gary Show. My name's Chris Scott, joined by my with my partner in crime here, Gary Kreth, and we're here to talk about all things real estate. And to be honest with you, we think we have a few things we can contribute. Between the two of us, we've been in the industry over 50 years now, I think, and so we think we have a few things that we can share that you'll benefit from. Today's topic is going to be of great interest to everybody because it is one of those things that if you're in real estate, you feel this pain. And so if you like the conversation, if you like what we're talking about, be sure to like the video. And if you like it, you might even want to comment on the video. Definitely subscribe to our channel. So Gary, let's dig in. With inventory levels being extremely low, according to National Association Realtors, almost 20% you know, below last year's levels, one of the big questions that we frequently get is, you know, what's the best way to find a listing? What's the best way to get a listing? And here's what we have found, is that the, these two questions in particular, um, how do I find a listing? How do I get a listing? They definitely imply a more passive approach yep. to getting listings. And that's kind of a problem, right? Because you've been selling real estate for what, 25, 26, 27 years. And you, it, that's a long time. And you know that getting a listing is anything but a passive activity, right? That It takes work. It takes an effort. Most importantly, it takes proper strategies to get the result that you want. Well, and, and, so, and, and importantly here, Chris, mm -hmm. it's not a golden nugget that you just pick up at a conference. It's not just this one piece of technology that's going to snap and all of a sudden you get listings. It is a process. It is a strategy and it must be implemented into your business and it must be done consistently. Otherwise, you get one listing and that's it. I also think that if you want to be able to truly solve the problem of finding listings or finding listing leads and just lead generation in general, instead of talking about how do I find and how do I get, I think a better question, a better place to start is to look at and study consumer behavior. And in this case, <laughs> specifically, if we look at seller behavior and ask ourselves, well, what are the seller behaviors that lead to and how do they choose a real estate agent that if we start there, it'll be easier to meet them where they're at. And right. instead of trying to find them, instead of trying to get that listing to land in our lap, if we know what their behaviors are, then we know what marketing to produce to meet them where they're at so that we can then actually cultivate them as a customer. And, and you know what, Chris, you always, you talk about a story that I think is really pertinent here. And that is you fish. I love to fish, so, but so, you so, fish so. a lot, right? You'll go down to the coast and you'll go I fishing. Do. Um, but do you just walk out there and just cast a line without any mm -hmm. knowledge as to what is biting, what they're biting and where they are? Uh, when I was new to fishing, you know, when I was a rookie fisherman, Yes, uh, I definitely just dropped lines in the water because I didn't. Have and and know. how did that work out for you? Uh, you know, very random. You know, you would catch a fish some days, um, but it was real hit or miss, with more misses than hits. Um, but once but, you get into fishing, right, you start to study things like, well, where are the fish? What are they eating? Because if I fish where the fish are at and I use the bait that they're eating, my chances of success are significantly, significantly higher. If nothing else, by just the sheer numbers. The fish yep. are there, so they're more likely to bite, right? But that takes a little bit of understanding. You know, the fish don't just always stay in the same place. And, you know, the fish definitely have, and depending on the type of fish you're fishing for, depending on the type of fish you're fishing for, you may have used, you might have to use different approaches. Just like with lead generation in real estate, finding a buyer might be one activity or one set of marketing strategies that we use or marketing content that we might use. But finding sellers might be slightly different because those are really two different people. They have two different interests. One is to find a home and then the other is to sell a home. Now that seller may also be buying a home in the process after they sell their home, but it does represent a different set of concerns. And if you look at seller behavior, 
right? And this is something that I find fascinating because we, we've been tracking, National Association of Realtors does this report. It's called the Profile of Home Buyers and Sellers. I and mean, every year they ask the same question, you know, what was the number, what, what were the determining factors in choosing your real estate agent? What was the number one determining factor in choosing your real estate agent? And, and you what know, survey says, survey says. Well, for sellers specifically, right, the number one determining factor that sellers use in choosing their listing agent is our reputation. It's the agent's reputation that is the determining factor. So, you know, a lot of people might say, well, I thought it was commission or fees, you know, like with the fees that I charge. In fact, many of us might pursue, you know, like looking at how do I reduce my fees and how to reduce my costs. But here's the thing. When sellers are making that choice, it's not the fees that they are using to base their decision. Now, of course, there's going to be, you know, exceptions to that. But by and large, the overwhelming majority of sellers, what they want is to work with somebody that they can trust. And they may or may not have worked with this individual before, which is why our reputation is going to um, amplify or represent that trust that they can have in us. And so hold on, hold on. You just said a really critical word that is often overlooked in sales. What was that word you just used? Because you've said reputation, 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 and then you just kind of dangled this other word in there and it is trust. Yes. So if you think about what is reputation, reputation in many ways is just another way to confirm or affirm trust, right? Can I trust you? Well, they look to your reputation to understand whether they can trust you. And trust, as you know, Gary, in any kind of professional service where um, in real estate, what, you know, what, 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 what clients buy from us is the professional service that we render. It's our experience. Yeah. It's our advice. It's the results that we produce as a result of that experience and advice and the tools that we use and, of course, all the support that we have. But that is how people choose who they're going to work with. And trust is a really interesting thing because when you start to understand that sellers, really all clients, they want to trust us and that's how they're going, that's going to influence their decision is who do they trust the most to help them get to the outcomes that they want. Now, all of a sudden we can look at trust and examine it a little bit differently because we can right. start to build trust, purposefully build trust um, because trust is based on two things, Gary, two things character and competence and that's it like and, and these answer specific questions for that seller if, if you're looking for listing leads for example then let's talk about sellers and sellers want to know can i trust you from a character perspective can i trust you to care more about me than my wallet right do you care more about me than the transaction that i represent they want to know this on the other side of the equation though is our competence they want to know, do you have the right skills and knowledge to produce the outcome that I want, to produce the results? And I, I, you know what I love about this, Chris, is it, it really breaks it down. Like you may be sitting here saying, well, what does this have to do with me getting my getting a listing business up and running and being consistent? It has everything to do with everything. It. And what's fascinating, and I heard this recently, Chris, I love this, is that your competence is what gets you in the door. Mm -hmm. Your character is what keeps you there. Uh, so, you, you know, as as listing agents, as real estate agents, we might want to um, be transparent and honest with ourselves about this. Where am I losing the listing opportunity or where am I losing the listing? Am I even getting in the door? And if we're not getting in the door, we really need to examine that competence factor of trust is that like, initially that's where we need to focus. We've got to build competence within our identity for these sellers. Now, mm -hmm. if your competence is strong and you have that identity and you're getting in the door, but you're losing every single listing at the appointment, we might want to look at your character. And I'm not bringing your character into question, but what I'm saying is that if your character is not observed and assessed by the seller in a way that they can trust you, then we need to look at the character and see how are you presenting your own character at the listing appointment. So it's really interesting to be able to dig into these things and understand like, where am I having breakdowns and where mm -hmm. do I need to work? And maybe it's both, you know, it, it could be, I'm not getting in the door, but when I do get in the door, it's like the blind squirrel finds a nut every so often. When I do get in the door, I lose the appointment every time. So we may actually need to work on 
building that identity and the trust in both areas. Well, I'd say that it really is both, Gary. I can't tell you how many times I have asked groups of real estate professionals, hey, how would you, in as few words as possible, how would you describe your reputation? And people will say all kinds of things. They'll say things like, uh, in, in, they'll say, I'm trustworthy, I'm honest, honest. I'm hardworking, right? Integrity. Lots of integrity. Lots of great qualities. You know, what Those some, are all character qualities. Yeah. And you know what something's oftentimes missing? The word real estate from that equation, right? <laughs> like, which oh, is the confidence factor, right? Which so, is the, that comes down to the confidence factor. Because you think about it, yeah. in order to be truly top of mind, right? Your sphere of influence, your contacts and connections, your local market, when they think of real estate, they need to think of you. And when they think of you, they need to think of real estate. So real estate absolutely has to be part of your reputation. And right. here's the thing. Most of us take an organic approach, a by accident approach to our reputation, meaning we don't sit down and think about, well, how do I want to be known? How do I want people to describe my character? How do I want these people to describe my confidence? Right. right? And so- advanced level thinking actually asked a better question. You see, when most people are, might be asking themselves, where do I find clients You know, who want to buy or sell right now? Yeah, it's a, it's we, an incomplete question. Would you say that? Very incomplete, very incomplete. What, what we really need to fill in a little mm -hmm. bit more, You know, where can I find a seller who trusts me enough to choose me? Right, like if you're looking for listings, how do I find sellers, practice, prospective sellers who want to buy, who want to sell right now who trust me enough to choose me because that's really what's happened. You know, Gary, the fact of the matter is most listings, most listings are lost before the appointment even happens. Man, think about this, right? Gary, I know this might be a little painful for you, but I know for a fact that you took a year off several years back from selling real estate. Was it 2012, yep. 2013, that time frame, And you took a year off. And you still sold some real estate along the way, right? You know, the deals came in here, but it was definitely lower. It was muted as you took that time off. You had to take care of some family. Um, but when you came back to real estate, you did a little of analysis because you're like, I wonder how many deals I lost. Well, I did. and But I didn't initially think of it like that, Chris. What yeah. happened is I picked up the phone when I got back into the office and I said, well, I need to, I need to start drumming up some business Delicious. here. So I started calling some of my past clients. The very first one I called, long-term client of mine. They bought and sold houses with me for years. And I said, hey, I just wanted to let you know I'm back in the saddle and all, and uh, just wanted to see if you guys have thought about selling your home recently. And they said, oh, well, we sold our home several months ago. We, uh, we actually thought you were you left the business. We, we sold our house already. I was like, okay. That was bad. So then <laughs> I, after a few calls like that, what I found is that a lot of my past clients had purchased or sold without me. And so uh, that prompted me to go through my database. And I went uh, through my database and I got about halfway through my database of researching, uh, comparing their address in my database to tax records of where they live now. And about halfway then and finding out how much they sold their previous home for from the MLS, about halfway through, I found that I had lost over $300,000 in gross commission income and that was from half of my database, simply because they bought or sold with somebody else. And I, I had to stop. I was like, okay, this is it's so too painful. Depressing. It's like, way too painful. And yeah. that's, what I, that's what I mean by saying that most listings and most opportunities are lost before the appointment. It's because you were in the running and you didn't know it. You were in the running though, but you didn't know it. And you know what? They never called you. They never... And you might say, well, how was I in the running if they never called me? Well, you sold them a home before. You helped them buy it. Like They worked with you in the past. That puts you in the running of any future transaction. Um, but if you're not staying in touch, but if I you have to be off the business. have to be top of mind. You have, have to be, top, to be of top of mind. We, we invented a system in response to Gary's experience that many, many years ago called the five-step real estate marketing system to fix and solve this very problem about building the trust around both character and competence so that we can generate more listing leads, so that we can work with more seller clients. Now, here's the deal. You actually end up finding both listing opportunities and buy side opportunities because of where we focus, right? Of where we're going to fish for opportunity because we want to fish where all the fish are at. And so this five-step real estate marketing system is something that we had created and have refined over the years, um, and it works really well. 
And the premise of it, the premise of it is this. We're going to do five simple steps, five marketing activities, right? Five. That's the five-step real estate marketing. So. five steps, right? So we do these five marketing activities, but instead of doing them randomly or just as, you know, just any, hey, we're just going to do this stuff. We actually do it in a specific sequence. They're all tied together. All five uh, marketing steps are tied together through the theme of a marketing campaign. Um, and then they are done in a sequential order designed to produce an outcome. Meaning when we do these one, two, three, four, five steps and we direct it at a source of business, that's how we get the result that we want. Uh, it's called multi-channel marketing or omnipresent marketing. It's actually a marketing principle that is old school, but we've updated it using new technology, the current set of technologies that are available to us, right? Technologies like tools and websites and emails and social media and videos and direct messaging. All of these things are the preferred methods of communication for consumers today, right, by and large. And so all we need to do then is to take those marketing activities, we can get into more detail, but direct it at an actual source of business. Now, we direct it at our contacts and connections for a really specific reason, and it's this. Home sellers, right, according to National Association of Realtors, about 70% of home sellers, the way they're going to find their real estate agent is this. They either were referred to you or knew you personally, or they worked with you before. That's the overwhelming majority. You know, people oftentimes think that, oh, I'm going to go buy some leads. Well, when it comes to buying seller leads, it's like 5% of the total pie, right? You know, Chris, it, this, this, let's, let's bring back the fishing metaphor here, okay? Should. If you're out there fishing and you know there's an, an enormous school of fish right over here, why in the world would you go over there? It doesn't I, make sense. So I think maybe if we break it down like this, maybe people will be scratching their heads saying, yeah, why do I do that? I, I and, hope, I hope, because here's the thing. I, I know why, because you and I are very susceptible to the shiny object, shiny penny syndrome. You know, you and I will be, we'll go to a conference or we'll see some advertising and we're like, oh, look at that new seller lead generation thingy, right? We buy, we, we get sucked into it just like everybody else. Well, the fact plus, of the matter is, the thing, Chris, most real estate agents, do, and I've, I ask, why are you not doing this to your contacts and connections? Most real estate agents who don't say this, uh, either I don't know what to send uh, or I don't want to feel like I'm bothering my contacts uh, and my connections. And my response is, did you know that your contacts and connections, they look to you as a leader in real estate and they're looking to you to lead them and guide them in their real estate ventures. But the thing is, is that if you are not contacting them with this valuable information through these five steps, what's going to happen is that they're going to think either you're not in business, you don't want to serve them, or for, for whatever reason, you're not offering your knowledge to them. And then that is why they go somewhere else. They don't go somewhere else because you're contacting them with valuable information. It's actually the other reason why. They That's go because exactly right. they you haven't been in contact with them. That's why yep. they go somewhere else. You know, it, it's very interesting when you look at um, the reasons why we might not communicate with people. I think a lot of it is also, here's another part of the, the puzzle, is, you know, Gary, you've sold what? How many homes do you think you sold in your career? Thousands? I mean, like, it, uh, I, I, you know, I lost count about 10 years ago and it was like 2,700. So okay. at this point, I mean, over, it's over got 3, way more. So the funny thing is you've sold, you've helped people buy and sell lots of homes. And I know for a fact as your partner that you do a great job in taking care of your clients. And you would think, and anybody would think that, hey, if I took great care of my customer, of course they would want to work with me again. Of course they'd want to refer me if they had a chance to do so. That is right? a wild assumption. That's a wild assumption. And, and, and here's the thing. In, in, a, in a perfect world, that would be true. In a world without noise, in a world without social media, in a world without competition, that would be true. But the fact is we're not in a perfect world. We do have competition. There's a tremendous amount of it out there, more than ever before, you know, by many measures. And so the fact is, we are not entitled to repeat business. We're not entitled to their referrals and their recommendations. In fact, we have to work even harder these days to get that. Now, those of us who do put in place systems like this to be able to capitalize on all of those recommendations and referrals and business from the sphere of influence, 
the people who know us and the people who know the people who know us and the repeat customers, right? If we want that, then all we have to do is focus on the contacts and connections, provide them with real estate related value on a consistent basis across multiple methods of communication, then you're going to get those opportunities uh, because you're top of mind. Remember what top of mind is. When they think of you, they think of real estate. When they think of real estate, they think of you. Now, through this process of consistency over time, we build trust. I'm sorry. You just said another golden word, which we have not even said today yet. What's that? I have to stop you. <laughs> consistency. Ah, yes. Because the because real estate marketing thing, system. Like anybody, I know anybody watching this right now, anybody can go do this once. Anybody can do this. Yes. And do it once. But that's but, not what it takes. I mean, everybody here watching this probably already agrees with the premise that sure. you got to do marketing in real estate. Like if, if you don't think you need to do marketing in real estate, you should probably stop watching this, go somewhere else. If you believe that you probably ought to do some marketing, you know, in real estate so that you can sell more real estate, then you're at the right place. Sure. But also know that if you know you have to do marketing, you also know you got to do marketing consistently. Because inconsistent marketing does not work. It's ineffective. We need consistent messaging over time to influence and persuade people. That's yeah. how our reputations get established and maintained is through consistency over time. Consistency is usually one of the biggest problems that people have. Uh, they're not quite sure what to send out. They're not quite sure how to send it out. And so we've made it pretty straightforward. We've made it pretty simple. In our five-step real estate marketing system, what we've done is... And I'll just kind of run through the five steps at a really high yeah, let's, level. Yeah, let's again. break this down for everybody here. You because know. I think it's easy to say blog and they're like, yeah, but I already I tried that. Do that I, doesn't do I work. Do I put recipes? Do I put the football yeah, yeah. schedule in my blog? You know, what am I putting in here? Yeah. So step one is to publish useful real estate information. We do this on a blog, on our website, because it's the easiest way then to publish and distribute this information. But very purposefully, we're producing and sharing real estate related information. Um, the goal here is to provide informational value that can be the reason for our outreach, right? So, I, Gary, I could you know call on you and say, "Hey, Gary, how you doing? Uh, I'm doing great. Let's talk about how many homes I'm selling." Oh, yeah, I'm the best thing since uh, whenever. You know. Oh, by the way, do you know anyone who's thinking of selling a home? Like, I can make it all about me and what I want. But instead, a better approach would be for me to just send you something that might be of interest to you that also exemplifies my professionalism and my expertise. So we like to choose real estate related values so that, oh, it would make sense coming from a realtor, right? This, in the example you see on the screen here, the seller's checklist, a timeline to prep your home for sale. Isn't that, doesn't that make sense for a listing agent to send something like that out to people, right? And the goal here though, is just to provide this informational value. Now here, in and of itself, just publishing a blog post probably isn't going to do much. Mm -hmm. So once we have this yeah, information, it's like build it and they will come. That does not work no. in real estate any longer. No, we have to start promoting it. And that's the whole purpose in creating it in the first place. It's not to hope that Google just starts sending you visitors, right? It's actually the opposite. Once we have this informational value, we can then start sharing this. And so step two is to start sending this out to the people that you know. Now, you, the best way to send or one of the ways to send out you know, a blog post is to email a link to people your blog post. And that's exactly what we do is for everybody we have an email address for in step number two, we summarize the blog post. Okay. We put a link to the actual article on our website and then we just email that to everybody we have an email address for. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy. No discount the value of email marketing when it comes to marketing. Email is still the highest, highest ROI activity that we do in marketing. Email marketing has the highest return on investment, usually because there's not a lot of cost associated with it. Um, and if you do it skillfully and you do it well, it can produce a great return. So that's why we do email. Now, you don't have email addresses for everybody that you know, which is why we also start to use and capitalize social media and social media videos in particular. So step number three is we will do what we call sharing a one minute video. And this is straightforward. All you're doing is you're discussing the highlights from that article we shared in step number one. And we're just discussing the highlights in a short form video. And we're using a short form video because that's what all the social media algorithms prefer. And so if we produce a short form video, which is basically just a vertical view video, like the version you see on your screen here, and about a minute long, discussing the highlights from the blog post, you just put that onto all of the social media accounts that you're currently using. And here's what happens is that 
because all of the social media algorithms or all the social media platforms have algorithms that decide what we're going to see, they prioritize short form video because it is the most um, desirable and digestible form of content out there right now. That's why TikTok is the thing. It's because short form video is what's trending. It is consumer behavior and action. And that's what people prefer. So that's why we do that. We want to make sure that we're sharing short videos that share our expertise that showcase us sharing our expertise and sharing the knowledge that we have. What's great about this is, you know, let's say you're sending this and your past clients, right? Your contacts and connections that you've known, maybe they haven't sold real estate with you. Maybe you haven't talked to them for a while. This might be the one of the few times where they have seen your face and heard your voice in a long time. Now, yep. if this is getting in front of people who haven't worked with you yet, this is the first impression that they're having of what it's like to work with you. They're hearing and experiencing your advice. So it's a really high value form of um, of communication. And because of the fact that social media algorithms prefer this type of content, it gets a lot more reach, a lot more distribution. And that's why it is step number three in the five-step real estate marketing system. Step number four is to do what we would call traditional social media posting. Um, this is where we're going to you know, take, again, snippets of information from the article that we wrote in step number one and just post that on social media. Why do we want to do that? Because um, here's what happens. As people go down the funnel of buying or selling a home, and as they start to choose and decide and make decisions around who they're going to work with, they're going to start researching the short list of agents extensively online prior to contacting. This is found, Google did a study a couple of years ago. They found that um, home buyers and sellers research their agent extensively. That was the word that they used, extensively online before contacting us. Even yep. if they knew us, even if they've worked with us before, think about it. They probably don't have our number on auto dial, right? So they Google us real quick. Is Gary still in the business, right? That's the first question they have is, you know, I, I worked with Gary five years ago. I wonder if he still sells real estate, right? Because if you now, haven't been sending if, information- if we're doing right? this omnipresent five-step marketing system- They know what They don't ask selling. that question. What they do is they will still go Google and say, what is Gary's phone number? I need his phone number because exactly. I got a Exactly. Exactly. And here's the other thing. They, you, they've been, you've been sending the information. So they've seen, you know, in your videos, they've seen your blog posts, but there's something about going to Google and doing that search because that search result that shows up, that's the window to your reputation. Think about it. Even people who have worked with you in the past, they're going to, and if, but if they haven't worked with you in a while, even if they've been receiving your information, they want to affirm, they want to affirm that you're the right person to work with. So yeah. a Google search oftentimes will do that. Um, the first page of search results on Google, if you're showing up there, you're, in, you're, you're well positioned. And here's the thing, many of those search results, if you're posting on social media on a regular basis, will show up in those Google search results. And so that's why we want to show up because if we're putting this information out there and they end up on our social media profiles, that's where they're validating whether they're going to work with us or not. Yeah. That's where the opportunity can be lost or not. So that's why we post engage on social media, which leads us to the fifth and final step. Now, which Chris, is I have a question for you because um, yeah. you've been talking about marketing up until this point. And I know we <laughs> call it the five-step marketing system, but in my mind, this is the transition from marketing, which are the first four steps, to more active prospecting. Would mm. you agree with that? Yes, yes. So in this fifth step, I like to call this the harvesting step. You know, if you do, if you, if you think of the first four steps, um, that's doing all the activity to prime the pump is to get ready, you know, to get the fields ready, to get the, it's, it's getting the Planting harvest the seeds, ready, everything like that, watering it. But this fifth step is where we harvest. Um, and this is where we can actually, it's like a lever to how much lead gen, how many leads and lead generation, um, efforts that we're going to get the results from, because as you start messaging people, here's what mm -hmm. happens. They've been getting your marketing. Right. And if you've been sending out the types of information that we're suggesting, right, tips on selling your home, tips on buying a home, stuff like that, then they know that you sell real estate. Sure. And so here's what happens is they know you sell real estate. And from a marketing perspective, right, they they know you're competent. You've been communicating this real estate advice on a consistent basis. So that makes you look very competent. Now, the question about your character is where this step um, comes into this play. This is where I see so many people really mess up, Chris. Oh, this is, so here's the thing. 
you know, we have been marketing our competence, you know, through the five, four, first four steps of the five step real estate marketing system. And this is our opportunity to show our character because the fact of the matter mm -hmm. is, and I'll, I'll remind you, you know, like earlier we had said that, um, when it comes to building trust, right. And it comes, when it comes to building character or people's interpretation of our character is that they want to know, can they trust you? Do you care more about them than their wallet? Do you care about them more than the transaction that they represent? Well, the well, best... well how, how do you how do you see people screwing this up though? Well, here's the thing: the best way for me to show you that I care is to reach out to you to see how you're doing, but not talk about real estate. Ah, uh, so that takes out the whole wallet part of it, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not reaching out saying, "Hey, Chris, are you and your wife thinking about selling your house anytime soon?" No, I mean, here's the thing: if you're regularly in contact with, let's say, your contacts and connections. Let's say, you know, one out of three, one out of five times. Sure. Ask them right. direct. Hey, you know, we've been talking. Hey, last time we talked, you mentioned that you were thinking of making a move. Are you guys, are you guys ready to have that conversation? Right. Here's the thing. The best way for you to be able to communicate your character is to reach out to people individually, one-on-one -on -one, to show them that you care about them. I mean, think about it. When's the last time you showed your contacts and connections that you care about them? I think this is a great example of showing somebody that you care and I actually sent this to a past client. This is not my business partner, Chris. This is a different Chris. And I said, hey, Chris, we haven't spoken in a while. I wanted to check in and see how things are going. He said, hey, man, so weird. I was just thinking about you. Hey. Huh. And well, so, and he's probably he, thinking something real estate related, right? Because well, that's he the, was. And so what we don't show here is that in the next message, I reached back out to him and we had a short conversation. And then he said, by the way, we were thinking about selling our house and moving closer into downtown Austin. Is that yeah. something you can help me with? Can Did I? I start the conversation that way? No, no. but here's but. the thing. They're always watching and observing, right? You think yep. about it. Cause here's, here's what happens. Let's say, instead of saying, Hey, you know, just checking in instead of, you know, like I like to say, Hey, you know, Gary, how are you doing? It, that just builds trust. If there's a real estate conversation to be had, they're going to bring it up. Here's the thing. When you go and ask them for something, here's actually a text that I got not too long ago. Um, how are you? Do you have a house for sale? This is like a real text that I got and I, I blocked out part of the number. So here's the thing. You send messages out like this and get, this is what your context and connections are going to say to themselves. You know what? Gary only reaches out to me when he wants something. That's that the, the worst last place. Thing. That's the worst that is place you could be, right? How is that trustworthy? You reach out to me only when you want something. Right. You ever have a, you know, you have, you have people like that in your life where the only time they call you is when they want something from you. Maybe well, it's from I, I don't a, know about you, Chris, but for me, when I see a certain person or a certain people calling, I get this, oh yeah. man, you know, yeah, I, even I though this, you know, you're not going to answer the phone, you're still like, you get a cringy feeling, you know? Well, I, I know they're going to leave a voicemail and then what's coming next is a text message, right? Yeah. And, and, and then you feel an obligation to respond, but then you know, they're drawing you in to trap you because they want something from you. So don't do this because this is, this builds the opposite of trust. It actually starts to get people to put their guard up and, and, and that's not, that's not effective. You're not going to build trust that way. You're not going to build an effective reputation by doing this. Instead, what we want you to do is reach out to people. And if there's a real estate conversation to be had, they'll bring it up when they're ready to. The fact of the matter is, if you're doing the first four steps, they know you sell real estate. Okay. And if you're doing it right, like you're choosing the right topics to send out, which we'll get into in a minute, then they know that you can help them with a lot of different aspects of real estate, buying, selling, investing, so on and so forth. Right. Yep. And so... All we have to do is to show up in the right way, right? By asking the right questions in this particular step. And when they're ready, they will say, oh, Gary, we've been meaning to reach out to you. So glad that you did. That's a much better experience for you and for them, by the way, for you and for them. Now, here's the key. I used that little word consistency, right? Consistency. So it must be done consistently. What yes. does that mean, Chris? Maybe we can share... Like what yeah. does consistently, consistently mean? We just got to repeat all five steps every month. Just repeat all five steps every month. But that means change the topic. Because if you talk about the same thing, a seller's checklist every single month, well, that just becomes noise. And so we want to change up the topics, right? So here's an example. Here's a topic in the blog post. Add value to your home with these nine do-it-yourself improvements. Okay, you would do all five of the steps. You know, the other steps is just the topic has changed. Here's another one. 
um, the five steps, five step strategy for downsizing your home. Again, all other steps we've done. Look at this, you know, who would this appeal to? Well, this would appeal to a seller. Um, that first one actually would appeal to both buyers and sellers. Um, well, this, what I like about that next one, Chris, is that baby boomers are the greatest oh. number of home sellers right now in the marketplace. So, yep. and what are most baby boomers doing? Downsizing. So yeah, I mean, this is speaking to it. And here's another one. Home equity playbook speaks to everybody. Love right? this one. Yep. Sellers, even renters. And so when you put together a calendar of topics, you know, you want to think about it from the perspective of, well, what would buyers be interested in? What would sellers be interested in? Heck, what would homeowners be interested in, right? Because this is going out to your contacts and connections. By the way, we don't just like say, well, who's buying and just send them one article. No, all of our contacts and connections get all, get everybody gets the topic of the month. And we're repeating all five steps so that we are ensuring that they're seeing it. And then the harvesting step of reaching out to them using that text messaging. Or, you know, like maybe you're working with a market that doesn't do texting, well, call them. Or maybe you're working with a market that is more into direct messaging, like on, on social media. Well, then direct message them on Instagram or whatever the case may be. Snapchat is a popular one for the other kids. Um, so that you're making sure that those messages are coming across. But when you do these five steps consistently, you do it well, right? And you don't do things like message people, hey, do you have a house for sale? Well, then good things happen. It brings us all the way back, right? This brings us all the way back to the question is not about how do I find a listing or a listing lead or you know how do I get a listing lead? How do I get leads? The question really is, what do I need to do? What are the strategies that I need to have? What's the content messaging that I need to have so that I can consistently generate listings over time, listing leads over time? And really, when you think about it, you want to suck out all the opportunity out of the room. You want to pull all of the opportunity out of your contacts and connections because it's the lion's share of where and how people are going to choose their real estate agent is right there through your contacts and connections. And if you're not doing a system like this, you're leaving a tremendous amount of money. If you're not doing something like this, Gary was leaving, you know, he, he left hundreds of thousands of dollars of GC gross commission income on the table by not doing this for a year. And, and he only took off one year and missed out that much. Imagine if it was, and here's the thing, this is no different than never, like Gary taking a year off is just like you, you guys not doing a system like this. Yeah, it's, it's the exact same thing. So might as well just take the year off and <laughs> take the whole vacation. Well, because here's if the crazy you're not thing. doing this consistently, might as well just take the time off. And here's the thing. We're like everybody else. We're in real estate. We get busy. We understand. Um, and we have gone through seasons where month, maybe years go by where we also have gotten fallen off the saddle from doing our own systems and strategies. What the beauty of it is this, whenever we hit the restart button and start doing the five-step real estate marketing system again, there's usually a little backlog of opportunity, right? A little bit of demand, so, you know, suppressed demand, uh, delayed demand that all of a sudden it's like, oh, we've been meaning to reach out. Oh, great, great. So, you know, if you haven't been doing it, this is oftentimes where people will see low hanging fruit or low hanging listing opportunity is just by starting to do a system like this. Well, and what we, what we hear is, oh my gosh, this really works. Yes. And it's not magic. It's science. So we really hope you enjoyed your time with us today. And if you did, make sure that you like this video. And if you want to see more videos like this, subscribe to our channel and have anything to say, comment down below. But more importantly, do you want the five steps that we shared, Chris? How do they get that today? Yeah, so if you want to have the marketing campaigns delivered to your inbox so that you can implement the five-step real estate marketing campaign and put your marketing on autopilot, you can try our marketing club for just a dollar. I'll include a link in the show description.